Good evening and welcome to Woman. Once again our topic is women's suffrage in England. With me is Midge McKenzie, creator and producer of Shoulder to Shoulder, which I'm sure you've been watching currently on Masterpiece Theatre. Midge is a film director and writer and author of this book, Shoulder to Shoulder. Welcome to Woman Mint. Midge, which came first, the book Shoulder to Shoulder or your television series Shoulder to Shoulder? Well, one kind of grew out of the other. What, what the book represents is that when I first met the suffragettes in March 1968, um, I worked for three years in between all the other work I was doing, meeting them, interviewing them, finding letters, finding their own magazine, going through the newspapers of the day, really kind of starting to, to dig into, um, you know, the documentary material that was available. Um, as I'm a documentary film director, um, the first question was, you know, would it make a documentary film? And the answer was no. You know, there were a few few pictures, a few headlines, a, a few elderly women, and the story was so enormous, it was so much bigger, you know, than than what could be done in documentary form, that it became necessary after three years to to do something else with it. And it was at that point that I teamed up with. Georgia Brown and Verity Lambert, and the three of us worked on it together for another year um, before we actually uh, got it off the ground as a TV series. And, and the plays, in fact, are documentary dramas. Everything that is said, everything that happens, really happened, is true. So what the book is, is what I've been working on for seven years. It's um, much, much bigger than the series, because obviously it's impossible to use everything. Uh, and it lays a sort of, you know, fantastic kind of background to everything that's happening. So it's sort of almost as if uh, um, the six plays become a kind of just a, a flavor of, of the women, of the characters, of the struggle, of what was going on. And um, the book becomes... What I did in doing the book was I, I did do it like a documentary film in print. Uh, when I went to books that had been... the few books that were around, that had been done in the 50s and 60s, I found them very dull. I found them unreadable. I felt the, the spirit of the women had gone. And so I wanted to do it in the first person. So all the material in the book is, is in the first person. I didn't transpose it. I wanted to share those women with you, for you to, to kind of get the same sense that I got from them, you know, in, in finding the material and in talking to them, that kind of so that's it. So it's like a documentary diary. You really do get a tremendous sense of excitement from the book, I mm. think. Just uh, mm. a sort of a real right on feeling. Mm. Yes, well, that's what I, when I found, as I found the material, I thought, God, you know, I really have to do something amazing with this. And so documentary plays was obviously dramatizing, was, was, was absolutely the right thing to do. And also to do the documentary book was very important to me. So kind of in a way, the book came first. In you, a sense. you actually got to meet some of the old suffragettes, didn't yes, you? Yes, I did. Which ones? Well, my favorite was uh, Lillian Lenton. And um, I first saw her on a television program about, um, you know, radical politics and so on and so forth. And it was a David Frost show. And there were a lot of men talking. And uh, you know how in those programs they always plant the front row of the audience if they run out of steam. You know, they can go up to so and so and so and so and say, what do you think? And there was this dear little old lady with silver curls. And he walked over and said, um, I understand that you were a radical in your day. And she said, yes. And he said, I understand you were an arsonist. And she said, yes. And he said, I wonder whether I could ask you how many buildings you burnt down. And she said, oh, about 60. And he said, I wonder if you could tell me what they were. She said, oh, no. She said, I'm afraid I couldn't. I only went to prison for a few of them. And you see, she was one of the more... She was a very young woman when she went into the movement, and I did spend some time with her before she died. Um, when they talked about arson, um, they never harmed people. Uh, the only people they, whose lives they ever endangered were their own. They were attacking the government through public opinion. And one of the ways to attack the government through public opinion was to find buildings under construction, buildings that were derelict, and burn them down, as a result of which the insurance companies had to pay the owners, as a result of which the insurance companies put enormous pressure on the government. 
because all the while the government was saying, of course we're going to give them the vote. We can't do it just now. You know, next session, next year, next parliamentary session, you know, never now. And so the politics of confrontation were always to, um, to force the issue and to make the issue dynamic. If, if, if you accept promises that are never delivered, um, you know, you're just forgotten. So you can't really compare them to some of the women who are being very revolutionary at this point, can you? Uh, not at all. In, not in this all. country, I mean. Not at all. No, no, no. No. I mean, they were. Um, there was a tradition in England. I mean, this, these were things that had been done by men in the 19th century to win the vote. Um, the, the government was very rigid. Um, there was no way they wanted women to have the vote. You also met uh, Alice Paul, who is an yes. American. Yes, I did. Yeah. Well, Alice um, was a postgraduate student in Europe, having been educated in America, when she met them and she joined them. And there's a lovely story of Alice being arrested and going, I think at the time she went to Cannon Road Police Station and there were so many of them there, there was over 200 of them there, that they had her in the billiard room. And that time when they went to prison, uh, they played a kind of football in the prison yard and were allowed to wear their own clothes because there were so many of them. And I think that's when she met Lucy Burns. And Lucy was wearing a little American flag sewn on her frock. And um, they became best friends and, of course, stayed in the movement there, were in prison, did hunger strike, were forcibly fed before coming back here and starting the Women's Party in 1913. But what's interesting, though, even though they came back here and started the Women's Party, they didn't really adopt those tactics, did they? Oh, to a certain extent. The marvelous story is when uh, President Wilson was being inaugurated, he arrived in Washington. And, and it was an empty station. And he said, where are, the, where are the people? And I said, oh, they're watching the suffrage parade. And that was Alice and Lucy. Yeah, I, I remember a march outside the White House in which uh, the story goes there was a, a certain amount of police brutality, but there weren't the, you know, the huge long hunger oh, strikes no, no, no. And, and things no, like no. that. No, Lucy, Lucy Burns was imprisoned in this country quite a few times, but that was in connection usually with picketing and lighting the watchfires. Uh, maybe at, they broke a few windows. Uh, I'm, I think that I'm was not familiar with that. Yeah. They certainly did in England. I mean, um, quote unquote, um, breaking windows is a time honored tradition to express political dissatisfaction, quote unquote, one, you know, suffragist. And um, the idea was to, to break windows in, in government buildings. And, you know, so actually, they use little pebbles and wrap them in suitable literature. Did you, did you meet anyone else? Yes, I met the cousin of um, Lady Constance Lytton, Una Duval, and um, she told me something that really moved me, because talking to the women themselves has a quality over and above and beyond information. It told me something about how they felt about one another. And women were very affectionate towards one another in England, certainly at the turn of the century. So that Constance Lytton was her cousin, and when they were both arrested at the same time, they were in prison at the same time, she said it was so cold and so miserable, we hugged one another to keep warm. And uh, I think because women came from very large families, many, many sisters of sharing rooms, there was an enormous affection between them and a bond of friendship. And that was just, you know, the one little thing she said that gave me the image of that affection and friendship, you know, even more intensified when they were sharing a prison sentence together. Constance Lytton is the one who died of a heart attack as a result of her... Yes. Imprisonment. Well, she had a bad heart condition and, and um, as a result of the forcible feeding that she underwent. I think that, that it's, her situation was terribly sad because I think she believed that, that unlike a working woman, if a, a working woman or a middle-class woman was forcibly fed and came out and described it, and they did come out and describe it, nobody listened. Uh, she felt that because she had such power in terms of her position as the daughter of the Viceroy of India and her brother in the House of Lords, that because she was a lady, ultimately people would believe her, and, and in the end they didn't. I mean, her brother organized the bill, but it was defeated. So she was just another casualty. You know, Let, let's um, talk road. a little bit about some of the kinds of confrontations, some, some that perhaps we haven't mentioned so far. What does cat and mouse mean to you? Well, uh, cat and mouse, the first thing that comes to my mind is 
Mouse Castle, because Mouse Castle is heaven. But in fact, it was pretty terrible. What was happening was that in the first hunger strike was in 1909. Uh, forcible feeding wasn't introduced until later. Um, the pattern would be for a suffragette to, to go on a deputation or to heckle a minister's meeting or to break up a meeting or to be arrested in connection with some militant act, to be in prison, to go on hunger strike, to then be forcibly fed close to death and then be released. At the point she was released, her sentence was waived. The Cat and Mouse Act meant that when she reached that point, she was given a little piece of paper which was called her license and she was let out and sent away to get well. And where she went to get well was Mouse Castle, which is run by Nurse Pine. And everybody went there to recuperate. And when she was well, she was meant to represent herself to Holloway Prison and go back to prison. Well, of course, they didn't. They, there was a whole period where they all went into disguise. And In fact, there's one wonderful woman in the book um, uh, who I found who's Canadian, Mary Richardson, and her al alias Polly Dick. And uh, they go underground in order not to be rearrested. Their, their political tactics were so inventive. Mm. It one, there's one story in the book that I recall. Uh, they sent themselves at letters at one point, as, as right. letters to the Prime That's Minister. Right. They discovered that you could mail yourself as a human letter. So one of them wore a, a big placard with the address on it, and the other one wore a big placard with the message on it, Give Women the Vote. And they were delivered to the Prime Minister's residence, 10 Downing Street, and uh, scurrying secretaries went backwards and forwards. And then finally somebody came and said, we refuse to accept you, you are to be returned. You are dead letters. <laughs> and they were returned to the post office. But I mean, they were very inventive. I mean, you see, they had to be because most political meetings were only attended by men. So when they were going to heckle a minister, they had to often go in disguise. I mean, for instance, Alice Paul, infiltrated one building by going disguised as a charwoman in the early hours of the morning and then hiding in the organ all day, you know, in the, in the hall. I mean, they, had, they were tremendously creative. They did... Uh, what was the reaction toward the violence? And I hate to use that word because, as you say, their only violence was, you know, toward themselves. I mean, the population at no point... Uh, there wasn't a great hue and cry. There, were, there was from... from people like the head of the College of Surgeons. There was a memorial from many, many leading doctors. There was, um, in terms of medical opinion, medical opinion was on their side. Uh, it's extremely dangerous. I mean, for instance, with Lillian, when she was being forcibly fed, the tube, went, instead of going down her throat, went into her lungs. Her lungs filled up with food. I mean, and this is the turn of the century when, you know, she nearly died from, from the most, I mean, it was awful. Some of them really never recovered. They I used mean. to hold them down. Absolutely, yes. But I mean, the worst thing was to, to take a length of tube, I mean, this long, and, and push it either up somebody's nose or down their throat, and then just pour, you know, bovril. Or and if they couldn't get their mouths open, they would put it through their nose. Well, they would use clamps, clamp their mouths open, just like dentist clamps. In fact, what happened in England when we were working on, in fact, when the series went on the air, because we've already been on the air there, is that two young women were in prison being forced to be fed. And in fact, um, as a result of working on the series, all the actresses um, came out on a picket line. Um, we couldn't get involved in the political dilemma because it was Dolores and Marion Price. We, couldn't get, we weren't involved in Irish politics. But what we were there to say was, women are being tortured in our prisons today because it wasn't being reported. Now, what year was that? That was the year before last. And they were still using the same methods. That's incredible. That's it's really incredible. incredible. Absolutely. And, uh, I mean, they, they nearly died. In, you know, it was really terrible. And they were moved to the man's prison. They were moved to for high security to Brixton Prison. And what was extraordinary was we had, they were having almost a press silence. We had almost a total press silence when we went out on that picket. And, I mean, we had done exactly, you know, you know sent all the press releases out, everything. It was a big picket. Well, is force feeding a fairly common thing in English no, prison? No, 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 no. I mean, is it done no. to men? Hunger striking, yes. Hunger striking is an old political weapon, and it was one that they adopted. I mean, paralleling um, the fight for suffrage in England was the, the troubles in Ireland. 
and there was a lot of hunger striking there at that time. So it was a traditional window smashing, incendiarism, uh, hunger striking were all traditional political weapons in England that were used. The sentences were very stiff also that they got. Oh yeah. Well the idea was to totally deter them as a group. Uh, totally. You see, popular opinion was not with them at all, obviously. I mean, they were presented by the media as being quite scandalous. And um, so that the government hoped, I mean, that to totally crush them. I mean, by 1913, when Emily Wilding Davison threw herself under the king's horse. Now, is that the episode that most people will have just seen when they yes. see this show? Yes. W when the show's played the first time. If the show reruns, then that's not valid. Yes. Yeah. Yes. The, um, she was so distressed. I mean, it was 1913. Christopher had fled to exile in 1912. In 1913, Mrs. Pankhurst had been sentenced for three years penal servitude and was going in and out of prison on hunger strikes with the Cat and Mouse Act. And the militants were becoming exhausted. Their bodies were becoming broken. They were very ill. And it was almost as if there was nothing they could do that would win women the vote. And the thing is that the confronted as they had been literally for 10 years with promises all the time. They were being promised the vote. They were never getting the vote. And I feel that what I found out about her background is that she was very religious and um, almost evangelical and uh, so that she would see herself as the necessary martyr for a powerful cause and struggle. And uh, so, that's so why you, she did it. So you really see her suicide as a kind of a religious... Oh, very much so. Very much so. Well, do you think that was common? Do you think a lot of them did? No, but I think that, that when you uh, engage in a, in a struggle which is so right, I mean, I say, for instance, I think the problem in so many areas of, of feminism today would be to find the right struggle. I mean, there are so many women fighting on so many different areas, whether it's medicine, whether it's childcare, whether it's education, whether it's uh, job training, whether it's job opportunity, whether it's equal pay. We're fighting scattering all across to, to, to make these achievements. They, so many things were wrong uh, that they had so much right on their side and that they became stronger and stronger as, as the effort to crush them. So they became stronger and stronger. You see, they saw the enemy. In most of society, the enemy is invisible. And that's very hard to fight if the enemy is invisible. They could see who was doing it to them. What effect did the war have on all of this? Oh, it was extraordinary. Um, I mean, the, they, literally, the women divided into three groups. Um, well, this was the first thing that happened. Uh, was that as men had to leave for the front, so the labor force of women was needed immediately to take their jobs in the factories to do ammunition work, as in this case in this picture. Um, the Pankhurst themselves committed themselves totally to cooperate with the government. Whatever the government felt it was necessary for women to do during the war, that would be what they would do. So they were doing... There was sort of a truce then. That's right, there was a truce. They were enlisting women. Here's a woman stoker. Women took over all the vital jobs. Were they getting the same pay? No way. That's what <laughs> Sylvia was working on. <laughs> Sylvia was uh, working in the East End of London, and um, she was working to organize against sweated labor. Women were being paid a third, a half, I mean, peanuts. Not only that, they were, a lot of them were having to work because the separation allowances from the soldiers going to the front left them very poor and penniless. Do women get equal pay in England now? No. They do not. We're still fighting for that legislation. That's an, um, what happened was that, that in the 1914-80 war, great fortunes were made because enormous government contracts were put out for this kind of work. And this is what Sylvia fought for all during the war. She created social services for uh, women and children and baby clinics. And what was her relationship to Christabel at this point? Totally alienated. I mean, they were so different. I mean, Christabel was the super terrific, ace, razor sharp, dynamite politician who, if it meant making friends with the government in order to take power after the war, that's what she was going to do. Sylvia, meanwhile, really cared about the people. It's almost as if Christabel sought political power. 
in a sense. She wanted political power. Um, in one of the plays, there's a wonderful line that Sylvia says, where she says about Christabel, she says, when you look at Christabel, you are looking at an emancipated woman. She has emancipated herself within the movement. That's building boat propellers. What I love is the bucket in the bottom left hand oh, corner, yes, I see. standing there. They were doing really, really heavy work. And um, the, um, what was amazing was that, I mean, just a little bit before, they'd been in whale bones and corsets and um, a totally repressed, depressed group of women. And I think that, that the war sort of united an enormous number of women. Look at that picture. They took over all the work on the land. And uh, I had trouble finding some of these pictures because uh, the Imperial War Museum was full of millions and millions of pictures of manicured nurses all dressed in white uh, doing perfect bandages. And I knew these women existed this way because um, I'd seen them in the national press. I mean, here are women wagon washers, a wagon being a horse-drawn cart. And um, the, um, I knew they were there but I really had a lot of trouble finding them for the book. This, of course, is a period that we really don't deal with in the series, is, uh, you know, all the different things that happened to women uh, in terms of the suffragists themselves. Became involved with the peace movement. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, they became involved in um, working with the government, and Sylvia became involved in equal pay and the social conditions of women at the time. Yeah. Then the women went to the front. I, don't, I think we have some pictures. Yeah. Of, yes. This is a, an ambulance donated by the miners to these two women who took it to the front. And uh, the, um, there were an enormous number of women driving ambulances there. Again, they're not in the, it's very hard to find them in the Imperial War Museum. These are women ambulance drivers in their fur coats in Calais, I think it's 1917. And uh, some of the nurses were riding on horseback into the trenches to treat the wounded. Here, here are women who've been in the trenches with their, uh, wearing their gas masks. This is our hidden history. I mean, this is our heritage that, that um, was denied us because none of this information was available in England. This subject is not taught in our schools. We knew nothing about how the vote was either fought for or won. That's my heroine. There she is. She's a Women's Royal Air Force motorcyclist in 1918. The new woman. The new woman. She's lovely. It's a marvelous photograph. Yeah, it's What happened to some of the specific people? What happened to Emmeline? I mean, uh, During the war years? Yeah. She worked with the government. I mean, she, she organized massive rallies called the Right to Serve. She was fighting the trade union movement. The trade union movement had just been coming along and trying to get decent wages for jobs. The war came along, and suddenly the government wanted this massive influx of cheap labor, so the trade union movement were fighting the government. And Emmeline Pankhurst was in the middle so that women were marching saying, you know, for the right to serve their country in time of crisis. So the enormous, there was also prejudice, of course, from men who were performing the vital services in the country about training women. And in the book, I found this marvelous um, document from the War Office, which describes all this work that women are being trained for in the First World War in England as in temporary replacement of if you get it any more seriously than that, you know, it is merely a temporary job during a time of national crisis will let you ride your motorbike. When it's all over, forget it. Talk a little bit about when they got the actual vote. Well, when they got the vote... It's 1918. 1918. When they got the vote, we also passed legislation to have women candidates stand. Um, women were a majority in the electorate. Um, I think 17 or 18 women candidates stood and did not, one got elected, but she was an Irish revolutionary, Countess Markovic, and um, she refused to take her seat because she wouldn't take an oath of allegiance to the English crown. So it wasn't until Nancy Lady Astor, who was an American, she was our first woman in the House of Commons. But when the women first got the vote in 1918, they all couldn't vote at that point. No, what happened was only women over 30 got the vote, and this was because women were the majority. So it wasn't until 1928 that all women over 21 got the vote. How old uh, were Christabel and Sylvia in 1918, do you know, often? They were in their middle, you know, middle to late 20s. Christabel ran as a candidate and was defeated. Was she allowed to vote that first time in 1918? Oh, sure, yeah. sure. Well, then they must have been over 30. Yeah. 
to my respiratory. <laughs> <laughs> and when did Emmeline die? She died. Well, there's this amazing unsupported rumour, which is that literally her funeral cortege passed the House of Commons as the measure giving all votes to women over 21 was passed. But in fact, what I, the story I love best is that in Victoria Gardens, right next to the House of Commons, is this exquisite uh, statue of Emmeline Pankhurst. There's an elderly woman with her arms out, and I thought, nobody ever knew, you know, that in 1913 she was serving three years penal servitude, you know, for fighting the government. And, um, see, what really happened in England was that, that literally the winning of votes was attributed to women's war work. What, what the militants achieved was they didn't win the vote on their own. What they did, there were many, many other suffrage organizations, was they made them strong. They made the vote such an issue that every woman had to think about it. Every woman had to make a decision. And very few women obviously became militants. I mean, it was a very extraordinary thing to do. Most of them joined conventional suffrage organizations, so that in 1916, at the height of women's war work, um, it was Millicent Garrick Fawcett, who was able to negotiate with the government, and the government was able to negotiate because they were seen to be not negotiating with these scandalous militants, but with the more conventional, traditional women, and the vote came through. And then the wonderful thing is the more traditional, conventional women then turned to the militants and said, we'd have got it sooner if it hadn't been for you. <laughs> <laughs> but it took them over 70 years, didn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Over 70 years. Mitch, we're out of time again. I thank you for being here. Thank you for watching, and good night.